Hey everyone, and welcome back. Let's discuss two very common SIBO mistakes. And by understanding these and avoiding these, I think we can vastly improve the outcomes, improve how quickly you reduce the symptoms that you're struggling with, whether this be abdominal pain, diarrhea, constipation, bloating, food reactivity, or maybe it's some of the SIBO symptoms that are not digestive in nature, brain fog, low mood, depression, anxiety, joint pain, skin eruptions. As you may already know, the small intestine, this is where SIBO occurs, is incredibly important for nutrient and caloric absorption, but also this is where the largest density of immune cells in your entire body resides. And so if this barrier is not functioning correctly, inflammation vis-a-vis -vis the immune system can be increased to try to clean up some of this leakage or dysfunctional absorption occurring in the small intestine. So it then begs the, uh, the, the question that if you're having these symptoms, well, maybe I can test for SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, to determine if this is or this is not present. And the most accurate way to do this is also invasive. This direct sampling, jejunal aspirates, it's known as where you have to stick a sampling device down into the small intestine, obtain some fluid, culture that fluid. And again, this is the gold standard, but for obvious reasons, it's not done readily. And so another offering is a SIBO breath test. This is where some sort of sugar, either glucose or lactulose, is consumed. And then at regular intervals, breath samples are taken, assessing various gas levels. Most typically, hydrogen and methane but newer testing is also looking at hydrogen sulfide. And this is where we start to get into the territory of mistakes. Hey everyone, if this video has been helpful, please subscribe, comment, and share it with one person you think it might help. Okay then, so the first mistake is testing with lactulose. As we mentioned a moment ago, there are generally two sugars that are consumed, lactulose or glucose. And although lactulose for a period was the preferred test. As more scientific research has been done, we're seeing that the lactulose test is not very accurate. So let me make this case. A 2020 meta-analysis looked at 25 studies. And across these 25 studies, 6,500 patients were examined, some of which had symptoms, some of which were healthy controls. Because remember, it's really important that we determine how accurate a test is in discriminating someone with symptoms or some sort of illness as compared to a healthy control. Because if not, then what ends up happening is almost everyone you test has the thing, and this is an inaccurate test. And so this is why studies just like this meta-analysis are performed. So we can see now that, again, there's 25 individual trials investigating this, what is the summary across these studies? And the results are fairly shocking and have really swayed the way I think about the lactulose test for SIBO. Now, again, they took those with IBS and they compared those to healthy controls, those who had no symptoms. They found a 36% positivity rate for SIBO in the IBS group and a 30% positivity in the healthy control group. So this is not a very good job of delineating between those who have symptoms and those who don't. It's almost identical, 30 to 36. If you double click on these results, what you see is that when using the lactulose test, healthy individuals had a 34% likelihood of having SIBO. If you used conversely, the glucose test, only 4% of individuals were positive. So what this tells us is that the lactulose test shows a positivity rate in normal healthy people that is nearly identical to those who have the symptoms of IBS. Or said another way, the lactulose test does not do an adequate job of telling us who has a problem and who doesn't because the positivity rate between those with SIBO and those who are healthy is nearly identical. Okay, so said simply, you should not use the lactulose test. We have enough data now that clearly answers this question. What we find when we compare results, looking at those who are healthy and are given a SIBO test and those who have 
the symptoms of gas, bloating, diarrhea, abdominal pain, food reactivity, we find that the positivity rate with lactulose is essentially identical. So healthy people are showing SIBO just as commonly as people who have food reactivity, bloating, indigestion, constipation, diarrhea. Therefore, it's really not an accurate test, and I don't think we can any longer recommend using this test. Now, the one caveat, the one point in defense of the lactulose test would be if you use more contemporary and up-to-date interpretation guidelines. Right? You probably heard, well, the lactulose test or any test has to be interpreted correctly. And that's a fair, in my opinion, sort of retort. However, there is one study that examined this. Again, giving the lactulose test, but using a more conservative diagnostic criteria known as the North American consensus. But yet again, they found the same thing. The positivity rate for SIBO was nearly exactly the same in those with active symptoms versus healthy controls. So said really simply, many people who use a lactulose test will be told they have SIBO who do not. And because of that, I no longer support use of this, the SIBO breath test that is lactulose. So mistake number one is getting a lactulose breath test. Mistake number two is using those breath test results to guide your treatment. The way we, that we can correct this would be to use your symptoms as a primary barometer. And let me just speak to the person who's having symptoms, as I have had throughout my life at various points, not feeling well, and looking for answers. I understand that testing has a lot of appeal, and I'm not claiming that all testing is bad, but what I am claiming is that we should really be reducing the reliance on the SIBO breath testing. And taking a big step back, and a big credit to a recent conversation we had with Dr. Alex Ford. He is a researcher over at the University of Leeds. He published a meta-analysis, many meta-analyses, one of which was in the Lancet on amitriptyline and a different meta-analysis on probiotics for IBS. One of the comments he made really got me thinking. And the comment was, if someone's had a episode, let's say of food poisoning or traveler's diarrhea, it may not be that this causes SIBO, which is one of the hypotheses, but it may more commonly be that this disruptive event causes a loss of what's known as oral tolerance to food, meaning your immune system starts reacting to food that it shouldn't. And many people watching or, or listening to this, this video or this podcast may have lived this experience in that food seems to be a trigger. What is insightful about this immune component is that it might not be the appropriate blame to say that bacterial overgrowth is culpable, but rather a dysfunctional immune system. And let me make this case. A 2020 clinical trial took IBS patients. So everyone in this group had symptoms. Some had SIBO, some did not have SIBO. Irrespective, they were all given the antibiotic rifaximin which can treat SIBO, but can also help with IBS. And what they found was gastrointestinal symptoms improved whether or not the person had SIBO. Um, so again, I think this is really important to underscore, which is everyone or nearly everyone in this study saw improvements in their symptoms irrespective of SIBO. So said another way, more people respond to, air quotes here, SIBO treatments than actually have SIBO, which really undercuts the utility of the testing. Why bother to test for SIBO if you know that you'll respond to treatments irrespective of your breath test results? There's another trial here that I think also makes this case. It's a 2022 clinical trial, again, looking at a large group of people who had the symptoms of IBS, some had SIBO, some did not have SIBO. They were all given a low FODMAP diet for six weeks. And they found that in 66% of individuals, there was a resolution of their symptoms. Again, irrespective of if they had SIBO or not, leading these researchers to state as follows, a low FODMAP diet is effective, key point here, 
regardless of the coexistence of bacterial overgrowth. This finding is important as it eliminates the need to perform time-consuming and sometimes unavailable SIBO breath tests. So again, the point here is kind of twofold. One, the accuracy of the lactulose SIBO breath test is very questionable. And then two, the need to know if you have SIBO or not, according to this data, is not necessary. But what's more important is to use therapeutics that improve symptoms. Again, coming back to some of the posits by Alex Ford, immune tolerance. So what therapeutics can modulate the immune system in the gut? And also one of the other pieces that Ford had mentioned was dysfunction in the gut brain access. And this might be why we see things helpful for the symptoms of IBS that aren't necessarily SIBO treatments per se, like hypnotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, meditation, time in nature, and exercise. And sort of tangential to that, probiotics have been shown to be very effective. So has the elemental diet and antimicrobial therapy has. But with antimicrobial therapy, it's doing more than just modulating bacteria. It's modulating the immune system. In fact, the low FODMAP diet is another good example wherein we know that the low FODMAP diet actively reduces leaky gut and inflammatory cytokines. So I feel the paradigm to be shifting away from a model that I used to endorse and practice myself, which is we need to know if you have SIBO and therefore tailor treatments to SIBO. And again, now with additional data, we're seeing that specifically the lactulose test is inaccurate. And separate to that, that more people respond to treatment than have the test. Therefore, I think it's becoming increasingly difficult to justify use of the test. But instead, we should be thinking about therapeutics that modulate this gut immune system and also the gut brain access. So in close, you can test if you want, that's fine. My concern is that you may be wasting time and money and focus. And it's more important really to look at your symptoms because the symptoms may be telling you about items going on in your body that we just can't easily assess. And this is the immune system in the gut and the gut brain access. So if you have SIBO or you're thinking about testing for SIBO, at some point you've probably confronted the, I don't feel like the labs and my symptoms match. Either you have symptoms and your test was negative, or maybe you had a positive test and then you treated and there was no seeming correlation between your lab retest values and your symptoms. And again, this is all evidenced by the argument that I've put together for you today, which is I don't think these tests really need to be done and are giving us any uh, really insightful clinical information. If you have symptoms, I hear you, I'm with you. Let's do everything we can to resolve your symptoms. But again, my argument is if we get rid of having to do everything regarding the testing, the prep, mailing it in, waiting for the results, waiting for your appointment to come around, and we look at your symptoms, this is going to remove unnecessary time and focus and allow you therefore to better focus on monitoring your symptoms, therefore what's going on with the gut immune system and the gut brain access, and therefore get to feeling better as quickly as you can. So hopefully that helps, and please do let me know in the comments what you think, what your experience has been, and per the usual, I hope this helps.